now for our last panel, uh, we've invited leaders of, of, of core open technology organizations to give us a little bit of a guide to the future. First, I'd like to introduce our session leader. Um, uh, Here's Guy Martin, uh, who will be introduced soon as well. Um, Dr. Ma Shaikh. Dr. Shaikh is an associate professor of digital innovation at King's College London, and she holds a PhD in information systems from the LSE. So I don't see Maha here, but uh, we'll give me one second. Um, let's see. Okay. Well, hello, everyone. Yeah, <laughs> I'm very glad to see you here. I don't know, especially the ones that are uh, stateside. I appreciate that you, uh, I wonder, have you stayed on for the, the entire summit since like early, early in the morning? Uh, I, I, unfortunately, absolutely. no. Jim says yes. <laughs> I, I was up at 4 a.m. Yeah, well, you know, I really appreciate that. And then staying here until the end, that's very nice. And here is my, okay. yeah, I'm glad. Okay, Ma, the, the floor is yours. Thanks. Yeah, my computer is working. It's good to hear you guys talking about me. I was talking back, but, but clearly uh, nothing was going through. So um, it, it's a great panel. I, I'm so excited about actually getting to meet you guys. Most of you are uh, well known to me in, in, by name at least. And it, it's, it's really fantastic actually getting to see you as well. It would have been so much better, of course, if we were in person. I'm not sure how much of an introduction you actually require. Of course, it would be nice if I could at least give you a name, but I think um, Astra's sort of done that for us. And looking at the time and the fact that we're already 10 minutes into our session, I'm not sure if we're going to be stopped short at exactly 10 to the hour. I'm keen to move on um, in the conversation. I think the only thing I really wanted was some um, basic ground rules. Um, I'm going to raise some of the questions um, just as for the broader audience so that you understand. These are questions that most of our panelists actually broach themselves. And then I've added a few. Let's see how many we can get through, but they're very interesting questions. So I think it's important that as many people on the panel that want to speak through um, and give a different answer to the same question, that's what I'd be looking for. It would just be more a matter of trying to get the tones right, but I'm sure we can navigate this um, in a nice way. Um, so, okay. So I'm going to start off with, and I'm just taking a stab right in the middle um, of a question. I'm not looking at any order, but what, uh, you know, what is the role of open source foundations um, that they play in enabling, protecting, and sustaining open innovation? I think this is a key question, considering we've got two different foundation um, representatives here and we're all invested. Sorry, three, I beg your pardon, but three. No, I'm really keen to see. Four, um, actually. I, well, I view Callista too as well. It's, all, it's four of us. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I'm not going to say who speaks first. I just like um, any one of you to sort of kick it off. I find people are over speaking over, then I might step in and navigate a little bit. I mean, I think Mike raised this question, right? Yeah. Mike, do you want to take a first stab at it? Well, yeah, actually, I'll, I will take a first step out if you don't mind. Um, and I just want to relate it back to something. For those who have been on the, this uh, event from the beginning, the chat has been um, pretty darn interesting and, and, and probably the, the most animated chat I've ever seen in all the virtual events I've attended this year. So congrats to the organizers and the, and the audience um, for that. But uh, Simon Phipps raised the point uh, that earlier that we say we focus too much on open and not enough on the collaboration network effect that we are using open to seek with the consequence that bad actors seek to adjust the definition of open in ways that invalidate the desired result. Um, and I would argue that Simon is exactly right um, and that a huge role that open source foundations play in the broader ecosystem of whatever we wanna call open is that it protects that collaboration. Um, ultimately, you know, the four of us who are here from foundations, you know, what do we do on a daily basis? We foster collaboration in an openly governed way that protects the assets that is there that created um, for all of the downstream consumers. And we resist the, uh, you know, we are institutionally, um, mandated to resist those who re try to um, redefine what openness means in our communities. And so I really believe that open source foundations um, are an absolutely integral part 
to protecting the definition of open collaboration, enabling open innovation, and making that sustainable for the long term. And I, I suppose you know you could we all, the four of us could talk you know for hours on this topic, but I think in a nutshell, um, that is what the role that foundations play. And the other earlier point that was made a couple of times actually was that just throwing stuff on GitHub uh, does not open source make. And again, about you know. Um, the protection, and we've seen this recently with the Elasticsearch um, kerfuffle that happened just a couple of uh, couple of we uh, weeks ago. That you know those things don't happen um, where your open source project and community is hosted at a foundation. Um, there's a whole level, uh, a different level of uh, protections uh, for both the community on the producing side and the downstream consumers of your open technology that arise as benefits from um, working with an open source foundation. Yeah. You know, Mike, the thing I look at too, is that, you know, corporate investment in open source, a lot of people have decried, you know, corporate investment in open source, but the reality is we're all sitting here talking at conferences like this because of the investment that comes from corporations into open source. So I don't necessarily think that's a bad thing, but I think that part of the role of foundations, as you kind of touched on, is really to be the place that neutrality and fairness and, and standard governance uh, reigns, right? I mean, there's, if you, if people are contributing to, corporations are contributing to open source, into foundations, there's sometimes an expectation of immediate ROI that in, in a lot of ways can be damaging long-term to the ecosystem. I think the role of all of us in foundations is to, is to be that neutral place that kind of threads the needle between too much over, you know, too much corporate influence, uh, while also allowing, you know, allowing that investment, but allowing all voices at the table, especially those who are doing all the technical work. So, you know, providing safe, transparent, pro-competitive pro governance and IPR practices that, that really give assurances to, like you said, the downstream, the public sector folks, uh, give them assurances that, that the technology is actually being managed fairly. Yeah, we're actually explicit on, we have content on our website that says explicitly, we, what we aspire to do is enable collaboration between the largest corporations on the planet and any individual contributor that wants to spend time at our, you know, on our projects. And the, that entire, you know, trying to um, enable the collaboration from all of those various parties um, and making the results freely available to all in a sustainable way, um, I think is what we do. You know, from software to the hardware world that I live in, it's really, that's the genesis from which all open source and open collaboration and open standards have come from. You look at, you know, sort of the beginning, it's when the playing field has become overweighted by one of those corporate interests that a, you know, a, a, an uprising of sorts starts to transpire. And that's when the collaboration starts to happen to take things into the open source to give us all an equal footing on that field through open building blocks, open based building blocks. And you've seen, you know, more recently that start to happen more readily in open hardware, such as RISC-V. Yep. Uh, Maha, if I could just jump in quickly from the perspective of a policymaker, uh, sure. but looking at the role of foundations, I think it's very important for us. Um, you know, when, as you heard the commissioner say at the start in his speech, that the open source is so important uh, for, for the development of, of uh, European economy and innovation. But from our perspective then, when we don't try to pick winners, but we try to pick those developments which are likely to go in the direction of where we see, for example, Europe's needs to develop and found help us to spot or to delineate the differences between the legitimate interests uh, of the members of the community and the project itself. So we don't get in the business of picking winners, but we do like to see what others who are very knowledgeable in this area would pick. And that is why the role of the foundation from a policymaker's point of view is so important because it's a very healthy sign when nobody dominates uh, the licensing uh, in, in a particular sector, when there's no one dominating, when there's a group of robust and credible uh, competitors perhaps working with the same licensed uh, um, code, that is a, a good indicator to us. So, so it's a very useful process. It was interesting in the last session that um, that Ms. Proust from, from Atos mentioned uh, the work that they're doing, for example, on bare metal with regard to the development of, of, of cloud stacks. Uh, we are looking uh, forward to some very exciting developments using a foundation 
for some open source that could become the basis of a combined effort uh, to compete with some of the proprietary uh, you know, cloud operating systems in the future. So it's, it's a very useful tool for us. Could I start? I'm, I'm sure, sorry, Jim, I'm sure you probably have something to say. I just wanted to sort of jump in. There's so many questions have already come up, which aren't on my list, and I, I'd, I'd really like to just sort of pursue them just gently, and then you can push back on me as well whenever you want. Uh, but this is a question to piss, but but probably broader, because you say you don't pick winners, and I totally understand that. But at the same time, I'm wondering, having done research to look at how companies choose different open source communities and different projects and which ones to invest in, which ones to step away from, they have to make decisions based on certain criteria. So even if you're not picking a winner, but a lot of people are investing in a particular project for a different reason, and foundations equally have to um, nurture and sustain some projects and stay away from others only because um, resources are fairly limited, right? So we have to work in a way that are within our means. So then how do you make this decision? And then can we really say that we're not picking winners when... Um, community members, volunteers, I'm only talking about volunteers, they choose a community to work in where they can build a reputation. We recognize that and we understand this reasoning. Companies also pick those projects that have a vibrant community and lots of ideas coming in, but also very importantly, where other companies are investing a lot of money because that means you'll get quality software and so on. So I wonder what the role of foundations here are trying to nurture a community that seems really essential but isn't getting this kind of volunteer collaboration or company interest or not and then how you uh, at a policy level make these decisions i mean i'm, I'm suppose i'm looking you don't have to talk about example um, projects if not but perhaps you could give us an example of that naming I mean, if, if it helps you but i'd like to know a little bit more about how you navigate this ecosystem Sometimes, honestly, with great difficulty. That's why, you know, being, being uh, asked by, uh, by OFE to sort of participate, uh, we learn a lot. And some of my team are here on the call, uh, have been listening in all afternoon, because it is a, um, a very uh, complex environment for us. Um, and I even saw in the chat that some people feel that as a result, uh, as a large institutional user, that the commission tends to go for safe proprietary brands uh, because we can't decide for ourselves. But in the world of innovation, uh, mm -hmm. It is clear that uh, when we see a community that we have invested in, in terms of taxpayers' uh, research funding, when we see the direction that they are going in, uh, and that also that the underlying uh, business model and licensing approach to the product is one mm -hmm. that does not create further customer lock-in, that does allow innovation and it does allow some very successful proprietary business cases to develop, for the good of the economy, then that's clearly the direction we want to go in. But yes, there will be failures. Um, but uh, you know, it's the benefits from a public policy point of view of looking at open source. It allows for uh, public scrutiny, but it also, more importantly, it allows for peer review, uh, independent peer review, which is a very good marker for us because we can't pretend to have the expertise. And of course, through the long term work and exposure that we have as a funder of research, a lot of that peer group are known to us. The bona fides of the community and the individuals who drive some of those communities are known to us. Uh, and, and therefore, we know that we can trust the judgment uh, and not rely on, on, on an individual marker or on something which would end up being biased in itself. So we're not naive. Uh, we haven't always got picked it right. And, um, you know, uh, there has been as all research and innovation, a certain amount of money that has been uh, put into things that sounded like a good idea and they didn't pay out. But that's, that's actually what the research and innovation process is there for. Mm -hmm. I could pick a few examples, again. Um, and my colleagues working on project management could pick a whole lot more. But it, it is the case uh, that through um, the foundations, through Okay, I will, I will pick a case because, again, uh, in the past session, I've, I've, I'm happy to hear fireware having been uh, referred to so often in the course of the afternoon, but including in the last session. Fireware is a great example uh, where you still have a repository of open source code which anybody can access. And now you have series of flavors working on OpenStack, which are becoming more and more branded. And that is fine. Mm -hmm because anybody can come back and unwrap that and develop their own, uh, their own um, um, uh, iteration, their own manifestation of it. 
But here we have a tool which is now a, a key part of what is our smart cities, our Green Deal policies with regard to mobility, energy use, environment, and I could go on and on. And that out of a relatively small amount of money which we invested in public-private partnership came from the Future Internet Choir. So that is an excellent example of the foundation approach. Thank you. Thanks very much. I, I was wondering if anybody, and especially Zim, Jim, I haven't really um, <laughs> allowed you to speak yet because I sort of stepped in. So um, yes, please, if you if you have something to say to this, or we can move on to another question. The question about how to select uh, open source different projects that we work on. Yeah. Yeah, we, we have a criteria. I mean, um, first of all, there are so many choices. There are 30 million uh, open repositories on GitHub. So uh, there's a cornucopia of open source out there. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we have a criteria. Um, one is forward looking and one is a little bit more backward looking. Uh, I'll start with the backward first. We uh, have engaged with uh, Harvard on research to understand what are the world's most widely deployed open source projects, the ones that we critically depend on as a society, you know, and then we ask, you know, who wrote them and, and are they secure? So we're looking to really understand a very finite set where, you know, not in the millions, but in the thousands of packages that uh, we all collectively depend upon. And then the foundation is working through our open source security foundation, our core infrastructure initiative, to go help provide resources to improve the stability and security of those particular uh, open source projects, many of which are, are here at the foundation itself. Forward looking, we've increasingly worked in vertical industries on projects that will move the needle on some particular technology initiative or impact, be impactful to society that have meaningful resources behind them both from individuals and from organizations that depend on those for uh, either commercialization or use in, in society. A good example of that is our LF Energy Initiative, which was started in Europe. Uh, this was uh, two European utilities, Aleander and RTE, that wanted to build software to uh, create a, a smarter way to distribute energy and get to a you know, zero emission society. Uh, and so that's something that we would definitely work on. It can be a body that enables competitors across the utility industry worldwide to work collectively on that. And we also um, work very hard to provide the resources commensurate with open source role in those important initiatives. We do, we spend millions of dollars on security audits. We have modern security tooling. We've advanced intellectual property management infrastructure we've set up for these initiatives. Um, we have, uh, as, as someone noted earlier, the Joint Development Foundation, which is a standards development organization that helps create uh, standards and then subsequently uh, submits them through their ISO PASS standard to, uh, process to uh, become international standards. So. Uh, we, that's a rough idea of how we uh, decide which projects we participate in. Thank you. Would anybody else like to step in or, or has anything different or I can move on to um, somebody else's question? I think one thing that I would add is it is the collective investment of so many stakeholders that make or break a foundation or an open source initiative success. It is not only the commercial interest, but the academic interest, the private and the public mm -hmm. uh, sectors working together. And this is something that transcends borders. As much as we all want to see local economies uh, proliferate and uh, grow, those are economies without borders as well. As much as you want to see local success, you want to have global opportunity. And that comes on two sides. One, uh, opportunity to innovate with anyone in the world, opportunity to build exactly what you want to solve the challenge you're facing. And on the other side, opportunity to take your, your products and your solutions globally and worldwide. And that is really where open source and, and open standards transcend those boundaries by ensuring that no one company, country, or other entity controls the technology. Mm -hmm. It cements that technology and that strategy for a long, durable future. You know, my, I'd just like to bring up one thing. I noticed, I've been noticing in the chat the whole conversation around member 
driven foundations versus individual driven foundations, the 501c6 versus c3. I actually think there's room and a, and a necessity for both. Obviously, you have representatives on this call from 501c6 type organizations that are member driven. But, you know, the work that the OSI does, the work that Apache does, the work that all these other foundations do is really important. And I think it's important to have both of those voices at, at the table, both the corporate interests who are making investment as well as the individuals and volunteers. And especially in Europe, where you, you read that study, there's a ton of individual contributions and, and contributions from small to medium businesses that maybe aren't represented in some of our foundations, but can be represented in some of these other foundations. So it's not an either or, uh, which kind of in the chat, it seems like it may be an either or, and I think there's actually room for both. Thank you. Okay, I'm gonna go to the next question then. Um, this one does come from you. Um, so how can the convergence of open source and open standards help bridge the gap and move things forward with government and other high regulated procurement environments which have traditionally focused more on standards and less on open source. Right, and and this question kind of came out of previous ex my previous experience uh, working as a consultant for U.S. Department of Defense. And what I found in these consulting engagements was that the rank and file technologists like myself appreciate and understand the value of open source. And sometimes, mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, you know, apologies to our friends in the policy and decision makers side, they maybe aren't as familiar with open source or they're becoming more familiar with, with, with events like this, but they tend to favor standards because of their governance rigor, because of the interoperability they provide, and because of the pro-competitive assurances that they have against, you know, the single vendor lock-in problem. Um, now, you know, open source can, can um, sometimes can't have good governance. And I know it's something that all of us work with on our foundations to help build better governance. Um, and, you know, but, but, you know, I think we can demystify open source in these procurement pipelines by modeling good governance in all of our foundations and explaining the path to standardization, right? The work that, that I know we're doing with, with our open projects effort to bring open source in and then explain the path to standardization and then use that when we're working with, with policymakers around what they, what they procure. But, you know, as a community, I think we really need to educate both the policymakers and more importantly, I think, encourage open source projects to do a better job of about thinking about these governance issues. Thank you. Um, would anybody else like to see? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, just a, Mike. Oh, yeah. Uh, sorry, Jim. Uh, go, um, just want to add that, you know, open source and open standards, I think, are absolutely synergistic. Um, yeah. And I think I think it's pretty much considered best practice in all the circles that I travel in now that what you want to have is an open standard with mm -hmm. a robust, or at least one robust open source implementation. And it's the combination of those two that give you the interoperability, the developer momentum and the industry momentum to have that technology become truly successful. Now, what I think policymakers really need to keep in mind is that if the standard setting organizations get in the way of enabling robust open source implementations, you're breaking the system that uh, at, that is working so well for us, right? So I think really one of the things that policy setters need to understand is that by allowing IP centric SDOs to continue to uh, set barriers to open source implementations, they are defeating the policy objectives that they insist they need in other conversations. Um, and I think we really need to focus on closing the loop um, between uh, the standard setting organizations and the enablement of open source implementations um, under permissive licenses um, that really helps set that ramp um, um, for rapid technology um, adoption across, across the, around the globe and across industries. Right. I mean, Mike, the, the open source definition or the open source, uh, the open standards definition, right? The OSI has put together, I think, is a fabulous example of making sure that we what we we don't do exactly what you're talking about, right? That we allow open standards to to thrive and open rep open source implementations of those standards to thrive as well. Yeah, when we did the spec process at the Eclipse Foundation a couple of years ago, we actually, you know, printed that out and put it on the wall. The you know the the open sources, uh, open specification requirements um, were absolutely key to the design point for what we are looking for when we when we drafted our spec process. 
Yeah, I, you wanted to step in. Uh, no, I agree with uh, both uh, Guy and, and, and Mike. You know, at the foundation many years ago, we embarked on what we saw coming, which is the convergence of, of standards and open source. I would add open data to that. You know, our view is we want to foster global innovation and a bottoms up sharing of uh, free information and ideas. And open source standards, open data licenses, we created an open data license. These are all tools in a tool belt that we utilize in order to enable that sharing of ideas. So we've set up structures, whether it's a Dutch shtick thing, a charity in the United States, a C6, a C3, a C, you know, what, 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 what uh, Calista has a Geneva based nonprofit. <laughs> Uh, we have SDO capabilities, we have uh, data license uh, sharing arrangements. I just, I think that the way to think about this is we all believe in the global sharing of ideas that collectively and globally, we need to work together to do better forms of innovation. We've set up a structure that can help configure whichever ingredients, whichever jurisdictions, whichever local law you need to work within in order to enable that. And, and we, we completely believe in that and, and are committed to it for the long term. Quickly, uh, because um, I'd like to say uh, to, what, uh, to what Guy said, I mean, I, I can own that. The, the public policy makers, the public administrations, well, we are trying to point in two directions at once from time to time. It is very difficult. Mm -hmm. uh, those who are paying, uh, you know, with, with the, as the Americans would say, the tax, uh, tax dollars, but uh, as we would say, um, you know, with public money, uh, have to be very prudent. And in fact, that prudence has perhaps uh, been um, contradictory to what we already see ourselves as being a very positive and necessary direction for, 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 for innovation to go. So that's where we need both communities to come together. We have tried in the European Standard Setting Organization to open up that discussion. But in the procurement sense, which I think is also where the question was asked, yes, it is a dilemma. And we have to get this right soon because increasingly in this domain, uh, the security requirements, the security specs are going to be, are going to predominate uh, even in, in, in sort of uh, what would appear to be quite uh, soft civil applications of technology. So that is where mm -hmm. if we do allow ourselves to be hemmed in by um, uh, inflexible standards, then there will not be a place for innovation, and that is not in our interests. So I'm, I'm acknowledging that the issue is a really big one for us. If you saw the mm -hmm. open source policy that uh, Mario Campolardo was talking about earlier on, the results of the study today also push us, uh, push us in that direction. But neither side can be doctrinaire, um, and we have to reach a situation in which we can have quickly adapted um, standards but also an understanding that, um, uh, you know, given that open source can be every bit as good as proprietary technology, where, where we have a duty to your community is to ensure that the standards are not actually derived from what is essentially proprietary technology. And unfortunately, in some domains, we have seen that that is essentially the case, that standards are basically a, a um, a, an unwrapping of proprietary technologies that a small or one uh, company has dominated them. So that's a challenge for us as well. We need you to help us do it. And there is an issue there, as Guy has said. You know, I, I, can I add, just add one quick thing, sort of seeing the chat go by, a lot of great discussion, by the way. I, I agree with somebody who said the chat and the, the hallway track in this conference is epic. You know, there's a lot of discussion there about, hey, open, you know, you're saying open source and open standards should be tightly coupled. I'm actually not saying that. And I would advocate that is not the case, right? I think having an open standard and Simon Phipps points out the open should also not only be who can participate, but who can use it. So royalty free standards, right? A big thing. Um, both, both of those are important, right? Having an open open source implementation is important, but having a standard that allows other implementations and those implementations may be closed or they may be other open implementations. So please, I, I guess my, my plea is understand that I'm not saying you have to couple open source and standards for this to be successful, right? It's not an either, and it's not an either or. Mm -hmm. oh, I, so I'm gonna stick to my guns. I still think open standards coupled with open source implementations is in fact a best mm -hmm. practice. And I, I see, I think I've seen it time and time again, where you are, and, and it, 
The interesting thing is, is that I've seen dynamics where it goes in either direction, where an open standard happens first, and then an open source uh, implementation comes along that really takes uh, the uh, adoption off like a rocket, or where you mm -hmm. have an open source implementation that attracts a sufficient interest. And I would say, you know, Kubernetes is, uh, and the work of the Cloud Native Computing Foundation is an excellent example of this, where you have something where the, the, the open source implementation is taking off like a rocket. All right, now let's settle down and create a spec for this, which you know theoretically could enable independent implementations. Why would you want to when there's a liberally licensed implementation that the ecosystem is rallied around? Um, but I see this flowing in either direction, and I'll stick to my guns that the combination is killer. Uh, yeah, Mike, I, we're not in disagreement, Mike. I've been saying you should be able to allow other implementations. I think yes, the, the yes. choice the choice is what's important here. Okay, yep. yes, we, I definitely agree that the enablement of an independent implementation is the very definition of a standard. Yes. I think, Mike, I, I would point out that you've illustrated the point about using multiple tools to achieve a goal. In the case of Kubernetes, which is a project uh, here at the Linux Foundation, we sought to create cloud portability having Kubernetes as the reference implementation and then having the OCI specification as a way to enforce portability requirements in exchange for licensing and trademark was a very good way to achieve that goal. We use, you know, sometimes we use one, we have uh, in, uh, efforts where they're standalone specifications that are utilized, but in the case of Kubernetes, it was a very effective way to achieve better portability across different cloud providers. Yep, absolutely. I just, I Sorry, just PS, did you say? <laughs> of course, from a, yeah. again from the the, the, the the public institution, the policymaker who's caught in this dilemma, uh, is, is that what goes with it? And I don't have to tell you because you know that this is the. Uh, oh, did he freeze? Uh -oh. I think we lost Pierce. <laughs> yeah, I was wondering if it was just a oh, screen, yes. Yeah. <laughs> The perils of virtual conference, unfortunately. I know. P.S. I'm not sure if you can hear us very clearly, but okay. No. Okay. Uh, well, forget it. Then I'm going to switch device. You carry on. <laughs> you can type it if you if you want. Well, oh, and now we lost, lost two. Uh -oh. No. <laughs> yeah. We Okay, I was just going to go to Jim's question, but maybe I'll come back to Jim's question when he's when he's here. I was going to do that question because it was a continuation of the regulatory framework, but uh, we'll catch up with it uh, at some other point. I had to go to your question, uh, uh, Kalista, because um, you're asking what are the nuances of hardware re um, relative to software and open collaboration relative to standards and open source, and the growing importance of open collaboration in a globally connected community, from innovation partners to supply chain. So very nice question. Yeah, I spoke, this, I spoke to this a little bit uh, earlier. I mean, uh, it, uh, how essential it is really for, how essential it really is for us to be able to collaborate globally. Mm -hmm. And, you know, open collaboration needs to go very much next to open specifications, open source. Um, open implementations, it's all hand in hand. And you, we even see, you know, some of the standards organizations getting closer to open collaboration uh, to get to the end point of, of what they're going to issue at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when it comes to hardware and, and software, the nuances are even more uh, clear, you might say. Uh, it's sort of uh, ne necessary to have an um, you know, a, a frozen specification. You, you don't get to apply patches if you've gone into manufacturing. It's sort of like recalling an airbag. It's very painful. And now with the explosion in uh, microprocessors in everything from your toothbrush to your headlights, it's even more important, right? You want to make sure that there are safety protocols, that there are transparency for security and all of these other elements that go in. And it's the inclusion of the many stakeholder points of view that make that possible. And you know, as, as we're seeing with Risk Five, that community is exploding. Uh, we have seen tremendous growth across our community in engagement from the many different stakeholders in uh, deriving those uh, specifications and those extensions on the base ISA. And those are really important 
mm-hmm. as we continue to move forward, that you're able to freeze something and continue to build upon it and take a very modular approach. It's something that's been done in software and is very essential in hardware, especially as you get into more custom implementations. At the end of the day, you want to see the, the commercial success built upon uh, the, you know, the specifications that you've already uh, derived, and that's what leads to uh, overall community success and adoption. Uh, and that's where you no longer have vendor lock-in, you no longer have uh, isolated cases where you can innovate, but that field remains uh, broadly uh, open for your next, your next challenge, your next technology challenge. If I could just add a little bit, I mean, uh, the, the, the part that we close to was just talking about that resonated the most with me is, is the global aspects of what we all do. Um, and, you know, we've gone through a couple of interesting years um, on many, 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 many dimensions. Um, and I think that uh, all of us on this panel are committed to doing everything that we can to make sure that the assets in our projects are shareable around the globe. Uh, on, you know, without any impediments. Uh, and, uh, you know, that, um, that global aspect of open source and, and open hardware is a big part of why this movement has become so successful. Um, the, you know, open, open in our world um, is open to all comers and all users, uh, wherever they may be, whatever they may be working on. Um, and, uh, you know, Simon likes to call it, you know, permissionless innovation. Uh, and whether it's happening in open source, open standards, or open hardware, um, that permissionless innovation that our, our various organizations enable um, is key to how innovation is happening today around the world. Yeah, you know, the one thing I would like to add uh, around supply chain, because when Callista brought this up, I think the thing that that struck me is the solar winds hack, right? We've all heard about the solar winds hack, and we all what we recognize is that we need the digital bill of materials. We need the software bill of materials. We need the hardware bill of materials. We, we are long past the point where we should be able to transparently tell what pieces of hardware and software are in all of our key, uh, key critical infrastructure that we rely on. Right. I mean, I think that to me is kind of some of the next frontier of getting a standard around software bill of materials, right? Getting a standard all around hardware bill of materials, putting that all together in something that, you know, we can rely on that, that public sector and, and even private companies can rely on to understand what's in the technology that they're, that they're purchasing. Would anybody else? Yeah, yes, uh, I'd like yeah. to come in on what Callista was saying. I think it's very important that at some times there, there does have to be this sort of freezing of specifications, at least as one iteration of the technology is taken in a direction. Uh, you know, using uh, at its core uh, risk five, you know, the European Union is investing very significant amount of money in the development of a, um, uh, of a supercomputer, as you might call it, but it's the future exascale supercomputers. Uh, where Europe hopes to continue to be to be competitive, and clearly for the level of investment and the level of industrial commitment required, you you have to have things that are very clear. Uh, it, it is great that it is an open source development, but this is where the um, uh, sort of the, the specifications for this work have to be frozen. So that was why what I wanted to say before uh, the internet threw me out. Um, it was quite simply that there is room for both, uh, but what is, what is most important is that uh, what, what open source has always brought to the discussion, which is the, the, the transparency, is that uh, it is subject to the, but also going back to the procurement for a small security application or a massive multi billion uh, exascale computing procurement, uh, it can be audited. By experts, and the example I wanted to give was a very quick one, slightly unusual. But in a matter of weeks, uh, when we had a decision to move to good tracing apps working on people's smartphones, working with the two largest mm-hmm. platform providers whom you know, we were able to deploy a group of open source experts in the Next Generation Internet Initiative to give a peer review of the open source, on the source uh, uh, code that was being used for those two apps, for the iterations on the two most common mobile platforms. And, and that is why, whether it's a security or a health 
or any other sensitive public policy application. Open source can work, the open source, source community can work, and can work in real time on some very critical uh, public sector, public service, and public policy issues. Which is exactly why I think open source is at the very center of some of the um, most prominent European policy initiatives. I'm thinking digital sovereignty, citizen privacy, ethical AI, right? By definition, for those policy initiatives to be successful, um, open source uh, and to a certain degree open data and to a certain degree open hardware mm -hmm. have to be part of the solution if you're gonna achieve the goals that you've set out for your societies. Absolutely, um, Jim. Um, I was hoping perhaps to step in with your question because we were still, we were still, and I think we still are talking a little bit about regulation. Uh, but let me know if if you feel that it's uh, or if we've um, done enough dust district already. But uh, you asked. We need to discuss thoughts on the regulatory environment as it pertains to open source and open standards across the globe. So I, I was wondering if you'd like to sort of start sure. that or sure. That. Yeah, I mean. Um... Great conversation, uh, and, and this whole morning has been, or very early morning for me has been wonderful. You know, I think that um, one of the challenges that we've been observing uh, is uh, um, one, you know, I think Mike alluded to this, we've had a bit of a setback on the global uh, free exchange of ideas through uh, various forms of uh, isolationism, techno-nationalism, uh, and those are uh, worrisome trends. And uh, our organization is uh, trying to do our best to set up structures. We, uh, uh, over a year ago, established uh, an entity in Europe. We have uh, entities in Geneva, Asia, North America, various different structures, whether it's charities, uh, associations, or uh, whatnot, in order to stick to that mission of the seamless sharing of ideas and innovation. Um, so that's sort of a macro issue. I think some of the things we've seen on the regulatory front uh, are uh, starting to come in around, obviously, data, um, but also cybersecurity. You know, we already mentioned the solar winds hack, uh, vulnerabilities in the global technology supply chain. I think one of the challenges for open source is to create structures that are commensurate with open source critical role in our collective uh, technology world, whether it's projects like our, our Lex Encrypt project, which is the, a certificate, the world's largest certificate authority. They've issued over a, a billion DLS certificates to help people protect their privacy, or uh, security initiatives that are coming, like SPDX and the implementation of software bill of materials so people know what they're running in their infrastructure. I think we're going to start seeing regulators ask about uh, developer identity. Not only what are you running, who wrote it? Uh, and I think that's going to be a difficult issue. You know, I, I've spent years trying to answer three simple questions. What is the world's most important shared software package version number? Who wrote it and is it secure? And the answer to those simple questions are incredibly difficult to answer because there is no unified global standard around the exchange of software package data across this global supply chain. Developer identity in some cases is good, nebulous in others. And I think there uh, needs to be an examination of uh, how those systems function and uh, there's certainly always room for improvement. So those are some of the things that I think uh, are coming, and uh, I think it's uh, behooven upon the collective open source community to get ahead of some of these issues. We certainly want to provide some leadership there. I, I put a couple of links into some initiatives that the LF uh, is working on in the chat window, but these are definitely going to be critical uh, issues that we'll all have to collectively face. So Jim, actually I have a question for you about developer identity. How do you how do you deal with that in the context of privacy, right? Especially we're talking we're in a European market about what if there's a question of hey, you know, I I I can verify that I wrote this, but I don't necessarily want my identity to be associated with it. How do you it's how do you great, balance those two things? It's a great question, and I wish uh, Brian Bellendorf from the Linux Foundation was on this call today because 
you would say, what's the question? The answer is blockchain. Um, <laughs> the answer is always blockchain, right? Uh, but we do um, have some efforts at the foundation around distributed identity systems that I think could be very relevant for this particular question. Uh, the work that we've done on our Linux Foundation public health effort in order to enable a privacy respecting contact tracing application uh, that's been implemented in Europe and places like Ireland and, and other uh, countries. These are things that I think can inform uh, and help us solve these difficult problems. Um, you know, there's no doubt that uh, we need to build privacy respecting systems. But there's an equal uh, um, concern, and this is one where if we can get ahead of it, it won't, you know, we won't see sort of ham-handed policy uh, around uh, understanding uh, who is participating in these huge uh, techno supply chains uh, in a way that we can all trust and rely upon. Right. But the, yeah. if I could Go sort ahead, of loop, loop this back to the policy uh, topic. Um, you know this privacy aspect that uh, comes from GDPR and the and the and the perfectly valid uh, interest in maintaining accurate developer records is a, is a, a, a fine example of where policies which are intended to um, have a certain outcome uh, you know who would who wouldn't want to respect citizen privacy uh, also can have a, um, a collateral damage effect on the ability for individual contributors to participate in open source organizations and communities. And so I think, um, uh, I think uh, one of the things, I think the lessons for uh, policymakers in Europe could come uh, from this is make sure that you include open source communities um, as part of the stakeholders that you consult with when you're constructing these sorts of policies, because um, I know that there was a, a Roberto De Cosmo and so from Software Heritage did a Hail Mary pass um, that saved certain aspects of the recent copyright directive from basically not uh, probably wouldn't have killed open source, but certainly made our lives collectively far more difficult than it would have otherwise. And, uh, you know, you know, we shouldn't need those Hail Mary passes if we were actually engaged as a respectable and reputable stakeholder at the beginning of the policy making process rather than a oh my god we got to save this at the end of the policy making process that's right mike and that that's why we need to start addressing these and, and coming up with uh collective solutions now and so I, I couldn't agree more with what you said i think i have to come back on this uh first but i'd love if roberto was on the call because uh, <laughs> uh, i'm not sure that he would recognize what you said is that uh, a Hail Mary pass, but I do know exactly what you're talking about, having discussed it with him at the time. However, well, it took him two years, but it was a Hail Mary. Okay. So on the GDPR issue, uh, we have, are faced in a number of cases with what we would call either uh, inflexible uh, or, or overzealous implications or applications of the GDPR. I would take as a corollary something from a different uh, area, but one which many of you are probably familiar. Uh, in the DNS world, in the ICANN world, where we have uh, DNS registry, uh, you know, the application of the GDPR to what was called a who is database, so that you could find out who actually is running a website, particularly if there's illegal content or, or, or even worse, terrorist or uh, child pedopornography or something that needs to be attacked immediately. Um, uh, the uh, GDPR was being used as an excuse to no longer provide that data. Uh, and of course, it goes back to the GDPR it does have the flexibility. You can identify a legitimate purpose in which personal data has to be processed. So if in certain sensitive cases you have individual developers who may have legitimate reasons not to be want to be identified to the outer world, they have to be identified to the developer community they're working with. But if not, this is where we can have uh, others, intermediaries who, who act on their behalf, but who would have to take responsibility, just as was said previously, that you need to know not only what am I running in my machine, but who developed it. There are legitimate reasons to know that. So we have to look at this in a more balanced way, not be overzealous in the GDPR, but also not give in to the mantra that in no circumstances should a person's personal data be revealed. That is not what the GDPR says. 
That, that's right, Pearson. And, you know, I, we'd be happy and, and are working on a lot of uh, efforts to understand how we can be both privacy respecting and create uh, ways to be responsible and responsible and commensurate with the critical nature of the collective dependence we have on these great works of, of code. And so um, it's something that I think will take some time, but it's something that we, we very much think about here. Right. Jim, can I add one thing? I mean, you, you brought up blockchain, right? So there are efforts underway, baseline project, for example, at Oasis, to do verifications of data um, and to transactions on the blockchain where you don't store the data on the public mainnet, for example, right? Where you've got these these ways of actually verifying these things without having data on the out there on the public mainnet. And I know it's something that came up in chat. So I just wanted to point out that there are ways of, of getting around that. Um, and everybody gives blockchain a bad name, but I think there we're working towards, I think the industry is working towards ways of utilizing blockchain in a way that, that doesn't make it a privacy issue. Yeah. I'm, I'm not familiar with that project, but I, I'll check it out. <laughs> Guys, I have Aster's a feeling that Aster's kicked in for a reason. Um, so I am going to let it go, but thank you so much. I ha had a whole bunch more um, questions of my own, but also new ones that arose from the discussion, which we haven't gotten around to. So I hope we have a chance in the future. That was really very enjoyable, not just yeah, informative. Right. Thanks, everybody. Enjoyable. Thank you very much. Thanks for having us. Thanks for thank having you. us. Well, thank you, Maha. Thank you, Mike, Pierce, Calista, Jim, and Guy. Thank you very much for, for attending uh, and speaking. And in fact, thank you to and session leaders who have helped us make today happen. Uh, while uh, we obviously covered a lot of topics uh, here today, and not just in the panels, but perhaps actually especially in the chat, uh, we at OFE see this as a starting point of taking the discussions and debates to the next level. Um, you know, now having discussed how far open source has come and how integral it is to society, um, how open collaboration started uh, as an idea and has turned into a world beating model for innovation. Uh, you know, with these realizations uh, uh, from our view, uh, there, there's, uh, there's a responsibility that comes with them and it is to engage with the bigger picture. So from OFE's side, as, as uh, mentioned by Sachiko now many hours ago, we will during 2021 here at OFE launch a new research pro program focused on ju just this. And, as always, it's not something we can do alone. So please do reach out with us and engage with us. And you know, one opportunity to do so, obviously in, in the coming days, you'll get access to all of the recordings. If you happen to, to miss a session that you're interested in during the day, but we will also send you invites to our summit series of virtual events that uh, will be a bit more of a you know, deep dives. And one of these, uh, uh, they, they will run throughout the spring and the early summer. And we will also have a specific one on the study when it's published. I saw there were many questions about this in the chat where we can really get into the nitty gritty. Um, and yeah, first of all, actually, starting already Thursday next week, and my colleague Sivan posted it in the chat, please register for the OFE launch series um, or launch events uh, on open source and standardization. It will be run every Thursday for the coming few weeks. Um, and as for this summit, uh, we look forward to seeing you on the Friday before uh, before FOSTEM in uh, 2022, and then hopefully in person in Brussels. Um, it would be great to meet in person. And you know, thanks for now. Have a lovely weekend. And um, I am really uh, looking forward to continuing these discussions about open source and the big challenges going forward. So bye now. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.